to do something special in my life, and it would have to do with entertainment, probably music. But what could a little kid from Decatur, Alabama possibly do that would matter to the world? One night, backstage in Memphis, I would find out. Elvis walked over to me, and my life was changed forever. I'm Larry D. here in the Great Smoky Mountains with me, a legend in his own time, Charlie Hodge. Charlie, you spent over 17 years of your life with one of the true legends of the 20th century. At all of Elvis's homes, there was always one bedroom. It was Charlie's bedroom. You performed with him on stage. You were in many of his movies. You were his vocal coach at one time and one of the best friends of his entire lifetime. You wrote a book, Me and Elvis, which today is a bestseller. And now this video. There's been a lot of things said about Elvis all these years, and a good bit of that is made up by the press. Elvis fans all over the world have followed his life and death, and for a long time, I felt the real story should be told from someone who was there, you know, by his side. And I especially wanted Lisa Marie to know the truth about her dad. I wanted to share some of the pictures and home movies most people have never seen before. Some clips of the fun times we had, the army, the music, the shows, personal family times, you know, the Elvis I knew. First of all, people should know that Elvis was a very intelligent man. He knew where he was going, and he knew how much he had to learn. He even realized after a time how big he was around the world, and he always had a plan and was in control. The staff had a logo we used on our jackets and everything, TCB. That meant taking care of business. That's what we did. That's what we wanted to do for Elvis. The entourage Elvis kept around him was made up of family members and friends. And I began to realize how important family was to Elvis when we were in the Army. I was singing with the Foggy River Boys in 1958 when I was drafted. And a stranger. After that first meeting backstage in Memphis, I would see Elvis again at Fort Hood. We both arrived for basic training about the same time. He remembered me, and uh, we saw each other from time to time. Elvis's mother was very ill that summer, so the Army gave him some time to go home and see her. She died suddenly while he was there, and when Elvis got back, he was numb with grief. And before we knew it, we were on a troop train headed for the port to ship out. We became friends on this trip. It was uh, about this time, I guess, that I started a role that I played the rest of my time with Elvis over the years. We were aboard ship, and Elvis had asked that I be assigned to the area where he put. They put Elvis up with the uh, NCOs, the sergeants and everything, because all the uh, soldiers wanted to get an autograph of Elvis and pictures made with him and everything, and the only way he could get a, any rest was to put him with the sergeants. So he didn't know anybody up there, and he asked that I be put up there with him. And of course, you know, it had only been a short time before that Elvis had lost his mother. And daytime was fine. We were going around the ship. We were playing with the accordion band and everything. And then at night, you know, after we went to bed, I could hear Elvis grieving in his uh, bunk. And I would get down and I'd start telling him jokes and stories until he, he would laugh, until finally he was just getting exhausted and he was tired and he could just go to sleep. And I thought, well, you know, this, I didn't realize that what I began there wouldn't be just a trip across the ocean. It'd be a trip around the world with my main man, Elvis. <laughs> what a life. If there was anybody that was ever a friend and uh, to Elvis Presley, it was Charlie Hodge. I was spit shining my shoes in barracks one day, and, and uh, somebody came over from the first sergeant's office and said that I had a phone call. I went over there, and Lamar said, asked me, could I get a 15-day leave? Elvis wanted to go to Paris. 
for 15 days. So I got permission, man, and uh, got in touch with the elders. We went three days in Munich, Germany, and then 10 days in Paris. So we got there, man, and the first thing we got there, we were exhausted. It's early in the morning, and we're up on a hill overlooking Paris. These people wanted to see the sunrise in Paris, and we were dying to go to sleep. So when uh, we started doing like all the tourists, we were catching the show at the Lido de Paris, the Moulin Rouge. Uh, we tried to be like regular tourists and walk up down the Champs Elysees, but they said, Elvis, you can walk around in Paris because they don't do stars like they do stars in any place else. They leave you alone. And we said, good. We went for a walk on the Champs Elysees, and you'd have thought Prince de Gaulle had come, Charles de Gaulle had come there, whatever his name was. And because the people hit us and we had to fight our way to a movie theater, buy a ticket and go in, and we called our driver that had the limousine, he'd come around and met us at the theater. We went straight through the theater, got the limousine and left. So we didn't try that anymore. But we'd go, we'd go shopping at little, different little places and catch the shows, and it became a daily. I remember one time, we were riding up the Champs-Élysées between the Arc of Triumph and the, and the Eiffel Tower, and Rex Mansfield and Elvis and I started singing a trio of some number, and we just kept singing the same song over and over again. And we was just going from one end of the street to the other one. And finally, you know, uh, we said, Lamarck, get out and go cancel the show. We were going to Lido show at night. So we had Lamarck go in and cancel it because it was more important. We were enjoying ourselves singing, just riding up and down there from the Champs-Élysées to the Eiffel Tower, you know, down the Champs-Élysées to the Eiffel Tower between the Arc of Triumph, you know. So we just rode and sang and sang. And then uh, the girls from the Lido show would come over and see us. And I remember one night they called, uh, the theater called and said, uh, could you have the girls come over? And we said, well, what's the problem? They said, well, we really would like to start the show. <laughs> They'd been there all night. <laughs> Elvis loved to watch the movies on the post, and he actually studied the actors. You know, he noticed that actors with dark hair lasted longer. His hair was naturally light, but after his first movie, Love Me Tender, he had that black. I think it was a couple of months, maybe six weeks or so, before we left Germany. We were having a little party at, at Elvis's house there at 14 Goethestrasse. I'll, I'll always remember that. And uh, a guy from the Air Force that was a friend of ours uh, brought this young lady over, and it was Priscilla. She was 14 years old at the time. And Elvis, I think, was just dumbfounded. I mean, he didn't hardly speak to anyone else the whole evening. He was just talking to her. And when she left, that evening, he called me over and he said, Charlie, did you see the structure of her face? It's almost like everything I've ever looked for in a woman. So I think he decided that night that Priscilla was going to be his wife. It was a pretty good plan because it worked out. <laughs> Elvis was getting ready to record his first album after getting back, and he asked me to go along to Nashville. When I asked him what I would do while he was busy recording, he said, well, we could sing All We'll Be Home Again, like we did on the ship. That'll be the first full duet I've ever put on an album. We had harmonized our way through the Army. We were on our way to Nashville and to another step in our relationship as musicians. From that time, for well over a decade, life was a series of phenomenal events. Elvis interrupted the recording session to go to Miami to appear live with Frank Sinatra. He'd been out of the Army only about a month. After Nashville, we would embark on an incredible journey to California by train to do a movie. Colonel Parker, Elvis's manager, had reserved two railroad cars for Elvis and all the guys. One was a sleeping car and the other was a private dining car. If you can picture this scene, all along the tracks, at every little train station and crossroads, People stood to see and wave as Elvis and the train went by. Even though the train didn't stop there, they knew Elvis was on that train. Much like the political campaigns years ago, Elvis was very quiet whenever he looked out. As I look back over my life, I don't think anything that happened to me was by chance. From uh, 1961, I guess it was, to 1966, I used to get tired of sitting around the studio when they were doing movies because you go uh, you get there at 8 o'clock in the morning, you don't do anything until 5 o'clock in the afternoon, then you go home and take a break. <laughs> but uh, So I, I talked to Elvis about me going out and working some nightclubs with Jimmy Wakely and because I had known Wakely on the old Ozark Jubilee and uh, I'd sung some with him. And so 
Elvis said, all right. And so I would go out and work these tours in Las Vegas, Lake Tahoe, and Reno with Wakely, and then come back in and do uh, like the soundtrack for a movie thing with Elvis, and then we'd go somewhere else with Wakely. I remember one time we came in, and I walked in through the gate, and I said, and Elvis and them were loading up the bus. I said, have a heart. I just got off the road. <laughs> and Elvis said, shut up, load your stuff, and let's go. <laughs> so we loaded up. And Elvis had just gotten this, this 1963 Dodge mobile home. And we always followed it behind with a, a station wagon pulling a trailer with all our clothes in it so it wouldn't be so much stuff on, on, in the bus. So kind of tell me, what was it really like to travel on the road with Elvis? I know we'd, we'd drive sometimes and we'd stop and we'd spend the day in a hotel because we'd drive all night long. And then get up uh, that night and sometimes Elvis would drive 100 miles and say, Let's check back in another hotel. I don't feel like that. And we'd stop on the side of the road, and we'd throw football, and we'd do everything. But what Elvis was, he was really anxious, really, to get back home. That's one of the reasons he got the bus, so he could have everybody together, and we could all go home together. I remember one time, we was coming through Arkansas, and we was listening to George Klein from WHPQ Radio. And he played a song by Tom Jones called A Green, Green Grass A Home. And that's the first time we had heard that. We had been out in Hollywood, I think, for three movies in a row. So we hadn't been home in probably nine months, you know. And we listened to that, and every one of us started tearing up a little bit. And so Elvis pulled over to the next uh, phone booth. He saw us said, Joe, call George, tell him to play that song again. So Joe called George. He played it again. Elvis stopped at the next phone booth to call him, tell him to play it again. And this went all the way from... Uh, uh, over there in West Memphis, Arkansas, uh, well, the other side of West Memphis, actually, to all the way through Memphis. So we got home. As he was calling. Every time we'd run in the phone booth, call George, tell him to play that song again. And, and George would announce on radio, he'd say, well, the King and the boys are on the way in, boys and girls, you know, and boom, 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 tell about it. So he was giving them a running description of us coming in and listening to Tom Jones. And then Tom Jones later became a, a very close friend with us. Very close friend. We were down in the den. I think we were playing records and listening to new demos for some an album Elvis was going to do. And uh, he El Char he El Charlie came in. I, ne I didn't realize he was you know, so short. And I was glad to see him because that made me. I was. I used to be the shortest guy in the group. And along comes Charlie. Now he's the shortest guy. So I, I was very glad to see Charlie Hodge. But uh, Elvis said, uh, "George, this is Charlie Hodge. I met him in the army. He used to be the Fog River Boys." I said, "Yeah, I remember you. He used to come out with that coke case, and we all laughed." And uh, Charlie said he'd heard Elvis talk about me quite a bit. So you're the disc jockey from Memphis, a good friend of Elvis. I said, yeah. And Charlie and I kind of hit it off pretty good. Elvis always like uh, would dress for all occasions and everything. We had like going driving across country. We had jumpsuits with our name on it. He had a great time with the truckers, didn't he? Elvis drive the the bus going across, and, and these truckers would recognize him going across, and they'd blow them big air horns, and Elvis would blow his horn, man. And then he'd like racing them across country. Of course, it wasn't a race, but he had fun. He was playing with the truckers, you know. He he had his own truck, customized, naturally. <laughs> but he he dressed special always. He he was Elvis was proud of who he was, and never wore a disguise that I know of at all. And he would always dress the way Elvis was supposed to look. So he was dressing for the fans every day. A lot of pride. Yeah, a lot of pride in what he had done, what he had accomplished, and who he was. And Elvis could dress. Nobody else would look that good in those clothes, but he would look fantastic, you know. You know, it's, it's funny. When we'd leave uh, Los Angeles going to uh, Hollywood or, or coming to Memphis, and we'd leave, and nobody would know what time we left. But somehow, when we got to Graceland, even if we flew, I, this is not going bus. If we left tonight, caught a plane, and it, it's uh, midnight here, and 6 o'clock in the morning, we're landing in uh, Memphis, there'd be a crowd there waiting. Somehow the fans knew we had left, and they passed the word to each other. And the same thing we'd go to L.A. There'd be nobody around the house in L.A., We'd leave late at night on a plane, go to L.A., get to the house, crowd of people standing out there when we got there. They kept in touch with, they had their own uh, underground. <laughs> they knew where you were going to They be. knew where we were, yeah. 
When we'd uh, get into a town, we'd be on tour, and we'd get off the plane, sometimes uh, they'd have like two or three Cadillac limousines there, and they was getting one, and uh, Dr. Nicopolis and myself were getting another one, and somebody else another one, and then we always had the bus for everybody else. And if there were any fans outside the airfield there when we went out, they didn't know which one to follow. Because Elvis could be in the front one, he could be in the middle one, he could be in the back one. Unless you could really get a good look at him. And the way those cars were moving, because the police were always the greatest anywhere we went. They gave us a police escort. So when we left the place, we was already doing 30 or 40 miles an hour when we hit the highway, you know. But Elvis, uh, we did that ever so often. Uh, you know, Elvis would be in one car, I'd be in another car with Dr. Nick Nicopolis, and then uh, you tell you couldn't tell it, it might not be anybody in those cars. Elvis might have been on the bus also with the rest of the guys. In fact, I remember one time when we were playing here in Tennessee, and we had a limousine to take us to the concert, and there's so many people outside the motel. We thought he was going to turn over the car, and from then on, for the next two nights we did concerts, we rode in the bus because we figured they couldn't turn that over. <laughs> The fans would get excited. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Now, tell me about the secret mission you had uh, in regards to Elvis's wedding. When, it, when Elvis decided to get married, uh, it was like Mission Impossible, man. Very few people knew what was going on, you know? Joe Esposito knew, and I knew, and the Colonel, of course, knew, because Colonel set it all up. And all the guys thought I was driving Colonel down to Palm Springs, because that was one of my normal jobs, drive him to Palm Springs go down Monday morning, pick him up, and drive him back. But what we were doing during this whole period of time is we was heading, like, going to Palm Springs, but, see, just before you get to Palm Springs, you turn left and go to Vegas. <laughs> so we were going to Vegas, and the colonel was setting up Elvis's wedding. And we couldn't even talk to each other about it. it everything had to be kept, each person doing what they're doing, nobody else knows what the other person's doing. And so this went on until the time for Elvis to get married, and then, we left the house and the cars, drove to the Beverly Wilshire Hotel, drove downstairs, went up and stayed in one of the rooms for two hours. Then after it got early in the morning, you could see any cars for We went down and got the cars and drove the rest of the way to Palm Springs. Then got up the next morning, everybody loaded in the planes and went to Las Vegas, where there's all the news media down there ready to grab, you know, get pictures of Elvis's wedding. Then all of a sudden, we're in Las Vegas. And the media, Colonel kept it so it wasn't like a circus. And Elvis and Priscilla got married, and then they came to the wedding breakfast, and that's where the media got to see them for the first time, and they were now man and wife. But the colonel handled that so there would be no circus. He, his marriage could have some elegance about it, you know, some privacy. And it was just beautiful. Charlie, tell me, after Elvis and Priscilla got married, the close-knit family you all were, how did your own personal lives change? whether at Graceland or in California, wherever. I think my favorite time of living with Elvis, where it was more like a family, was when Elvis and Priscilla got married. Uh, Priscilla took over the running of the household, you know, and planning the meals and everything. And we ate dinner every evening in the dining room, like at Graceland and also at the house in L.A. And Priscilla would set a certain place, Patchy and Gigi at another place, and me at another place. And uh, we'd have a meal every evening. It was like a family. Because, and all the guys used to come there, Priscilla told them, I remember, she said, oh, you guys are welcome to eat what we're having for dinner. But you eat what we have. You don't come in here and place an order like it's a short order cook. So this is a home, not a short order restaurant. And she began to plan it. It felt like a home. You know, it's just... There was always one room that was Charlie's room. And she just fixed this and that's with my, my favorite colors and everything, you know. And we'd have dinner there in the evenings and Joe and Joni would come up and join us. You know, Joe Esposito and his wife Joni. Sometimes Colonel Parker and Tom Diskin, his aide, would come up and have dinner with us. And it was like a family, you know, and it felt good. I missed it when their marriage was over. I really missed that. Yeah, Charlie lived at Graceland, and I think that really was good for Elvis because uh, Elvis, uh, truth be known, Elvis really liked to have as many guys as he possibly could live at Graceland. Well, it's funny, when I first moved into Graceland, my room was upstairs, you know? 
And then Elvis decided he needed a bigger closet. So I moved downstairs and they knocked the wall out and took my bedroom and made a closet out of it. And it was a regular sized bedroom. It was just he needed that bigger closet. Then I moved downstairs into a room next to where the three TVs are in the wall. And I lived down there for years. And then the last couple of years that Elvis was alive, I lived in a garage apartment. And it's kind of like I had my own living room out there and own a huge bedroom. And I could bring my friends in to visit with me without taking them inside Grayson. But Grayson is, uh, Grayson is just the greatest memories in, in the world, man. That's where we played, we planned things, got ready to go to Hollywood, came back from Hollywood. Just, oh, there's so many memories there. You, you were in many of Elvis's movies, and I remember a part you played in the movie Charo. We were on location in Arizona, and Elvis was, uh, he was looking forward to doing a Western, you know, to where he was, uh, in the picture, he's like a gunslinger, a Charo. And uh, then we got there, and the script started changing, because, uh, well, Elvis said it was about the time that they started talking about all the violence on television and in movies and everything. So Elvis, he said, well, the gunfights are turning into dirty looks, you know? And uh, he went over to Charles Marcus Warren, that, who wrote the, uh, the script for that movie and was the director. And he said, what's wrong, uh, Mr. Warren? And he said, Elvis said, uh, they called me three weeks ago and said, we're doing an Elvis Western. We didn't, they didn't say we're doing an Elvis movie, and it's a Western. We're doing an Elvis Western. And said, and I had to write this thing in three weeks. And he looked at Mr. Warren, he said, Mr. Warren, let's do our job, take the money, and run. I was walking around on the set of Clambake one day, and we'd been having a water battle. You know, we had water guns, and then that wasn't enough, we'd get a glass of water and sometimes take shaving cream, put a head on it, you know, to have our water battles. And then it got into buckets of water. And I was standing around the edge of Elvis's trailer waiting for him to come out. And one of the guys had climbed all the way to the top of that studio, one of those catwalks, and a bucket of water hit me right in the head, you know. And I looked up and the second bucket got me right in the face. You know, I was, my shirt was just drenched. So, I went over to wardrobe and got me a dry shirt, and then I went over and put it in one of those big blowers they have on the set to keep the air circulating. I hung it up in front of it, you know, to dry. And about every 20 minutes or so, I'd go back over and feel of it, and it's still raining wet, you know. And I'm telling you, this went on all day. Every 20 minutes or so, I, we went out, we broke for lunch. It was gone an hour, I come back and it was still wet. So one time, I went around there and felt it, it's still wet, and so I walked around the edge of the trailer and I turned and sneaked back and looked around, and Elvis had a fire extinguisher soon was getting it all wet again. He'd been doing that all day long. <laughs> we was doing a picture of the Trouble with Girl. It was one of those pictures where we were having water battles, you know, and, and firecrackers, we'd light around each other and just, you know, just things to do when they weren't shooting. And it was getting towards the end of the picture, and the last scene they shot was uh, a scene where Elvis was, was lying on, a, on a, a circular thing that went around like that. It was all black, and he was in pajamas so they could show that scene where he's floating through the air and so forth. So that was the last scene, and Elvis kept feeling something was up. He said, Charlie, said they're, they're up to something. They're going to do something. Said, you and Joe find out what it was. Well, somehow I got sent to the colonel's office and Joe got sent somewhere else and we never did find out what they had planned. And what they did, as soon as the uh, director yelled, cut, and then the assistant director says, that's a wrap. That means that's all the shooting it's over with. Richard Davis and I think Jerry Schilling, all these guys had pies that they had gone and bought. And Elvis raised up, and by the time he raised up, they, he caught pies coming in every direction. He was picking up just meringue pie and throwing it back at him like that, you know. And uh, uh, just got pie all over. Well, he went and cleaned up. He said, find, find out where they are. I said, said uh, uh, and uh, Debbie Reynolds, Bill Reynolds' brother, was Elvis' makeup. 
man. That was Debbie Reynolds' brother. And he was over at this little bar. It's kind of catacombing from the, th from the movie studio with his friends laughing, having a beer. Oh, we got Elvis, man. He's been shooting those firecrackers. We got him this time. Well, Elvis sent us guys to grocery stores. And we went and bought whipped cream. We must have had 20 cans of whipped cream. So we went over to this little pub, and we came in from both doors. And Bill looked, and there was nowhere to go. We, was coming in the, we were coming in the only exits, you know. And he's over in the corner like that, and Elvis and them just took whipped cream and just buried him in the corner with whipped cream there, man. And then we just <laughs> and left. <laughs> but it was all in fun. It was all in fun. Elvis loved the islands. Hawaii was one of his favorite places to go. We went there several times over the years. And he used to love to stay at the Coco Palms Hotel because that's where he'd stay when he did the film Blue Hawaii. He loved the Hawaiian ceremonies at dinner time. To announce dinner, the hotel set signal fires among the trees. And also while he was there, the Navy always put their admiral's barge at his disposal. What not many people knew is that Elvis had given a special concert to help pay for the Arizona Memorial in Pearl Harbor. Just beneath the memorial is the sunken battleship. Whenever he went to Hawaii, he liked to take people out to visit the memorial. Elvis was resting in his dressing room right after the Aloha from Hawaii television special, which, by the way, was seen by two billion people around the world. Um, one of the guys came in and said there was uh, someone to see Elvis, and it was Jack Lord. Well, now, uh, Hawaii Five-0 and, and Jack Lord, Elvis watched them every time they were on, so that was one of his favorites. So Jack came back there, and man, it was just like instant friendship, you know? And Jack was talking to Elvis, and he said, you know, I, said, I don't think I've ever heard such dramatic music in my life. And Elvis said, Charlie, get this man a seat. We don't want to lose him, you know. And then the next week, Jack and Marie, his wife, invited Elvis and all those guys over for dinner at their apartment. You know, uh, once Linda Lee was, uh, had come up to see Elvis at his suite there, uh, her dad was doing a recording session one time, and he needed a tenor singer. And she said, well, Charlie Hodge works for Elvis, and he used to be with the Fog River Boys, so Wakely um, had me come over and do a recording with him, you know, doing some vocal backup with this quartet he had. And then George Ritchie, who's married to Tammy Wynette now, George came because he was my piano player uh, when I went in the Army with the Fog River Boys. And George came to me about reorganizing the Foggers, and I was getting kind of tired of sitting around movie sets, so I talked to Elvis about me going on the road with the quartet and working some in Nevada. And he said, well, go ahead, you know, just come back in and help me do the sessions and everything. When you're not working, you come back here as home, okay. So I uh, had the quartet there and then the quartet broke up and I stayed with Wakely up to 1966, working uh, along with Louis Prima, uh, Sam Buter and the Witnesses, Harry James, you know, the orchestra. Uh, Harry James was my Keno playing buddy. And uh, just a lot of stars I was working with there in Nevada and kind of learning, I guess, what I needed to know to lay out a show for Elvis. Because in 1966, I decided I, I really didn't have any time that I was given to Charlie Hodge. Because it was either working with Wakey and doing shows or coming in and doing something with Elvis and I had no time for me. So I decided I'd leave the Wakey show and just work for Elvis. And at that time we weren't touring, see, we were just, uh, doing the, you know, movies and things like that. So I came back and then, then they started this thing of getting ready for the 68 comeback. And Elvis talked to me and he said, you know, Charlie, I'm, I'm a little worried because I've done all these movies and everything. And said, I've forgotten everything and I think I may have lost it. And I said, well, no, you hadn't. I said, it's just a matter of working on it again. And Elvis and I started working on his voice. The guys would go to sleep maybe 1, 1.30 in the morning. And Elvis and I would start, and seven, eight o'clock in the morning, we'd still be sitting around the piano, just working on his voice control, his placement, and getting his projection going good, and then, you know, learn to support his tones real good. And then we did the 68 comeback, and then they started talking about going to Nirvana and working there. 
Well, we had to start thinking about what he could do, you know, because it, it, Elvis used to just go out on stage on, uh, with he and Scott and Bill, and they'd do, on those one-nighters and everything, they'd do maybe 15, 20 minutes because there were other people on the show, and that'd be about it. Well, now we were going to have to do an hour show. So it was up to me then to start pacing it. So once we started rehearsing and everything, we, Joe Esposito would always time all the numbers and keep a list of them. And we would rehearse in one night. We'd rehearse as many as 40, 50 numbers. And people say, well, how do you get a show out of that? You got to rehearse a show. Well, what we did is what we rehearsed, I took and made a show out of it. When Elvis would start to do something, uh, Charlie, would you take that fellow singer, uh, started singing a song that nobody knew. And uh, Charlie knew that we did. So he would point at the stamps and uh, even give us the chord to sing with a uh, to sing the background with Elvis. Charlie always stood there and, and supported Elvis and, of course, encouraged him. Elvis always had a lot, always had to have a lot of encouragement. Because, you know, it's real funny. Elvis didn't think he could dance. He didn't think he could play a piano or guitar. And he, I, how many times I heard him say, man, I can't sing this. But Charlie and, of course, the Jordanaires and various ones were there to tell him, yes, you can, and you're going to, and you can do a good job, and, and the results came out very great. So that became my job to lay out the shows, and subject always to Elvis's approval, of course. And so once we started working in Nevada, uh, we'd do a rehearsal, and I'd lay out a show, and Elvis would say, yeah, that'd be good. Then maybe later on, about halfway through, Charlie said, do you think we could do such and such song, something else rehearsing? Said, yeah, we can put it right here. He said, well, let's put that in there tonight. So put that in, and then he would decide he didn't want to lose that other number. See? So then I would tell him, well, they're about the same tempo, so talk between the songs. And then people won't notice it when you go back into it, say the same tempo. Because he, he'd be doing a song, and he wouldn't want to throw it away. Over the years, uh, with songs that he did on stage or songs that he planned to do on stage, we had over 500 orchestrations at, that he could have done at any time. If he'd just called it out, the, the music was there. Uh, Charlie Hodge, I think he, Charlie had a whole lot to do with Elvis's stage performance. Now, I don't mean Elvis's personal performance, I'm talking about the production on the stage, where the band was, what songs, and Charlie, if Elvis uh, uh, drew a blank for a moment, so Charlie, where are he? Elvis would throw out a song like, well, One Night or, or The Wonder of You. Charlie knew the tempo of the muse. Where Elvis may get involved with the audience or Elvis may be making a speech, introducing the band, Charlie always had the song list there and they knew the tempo of the songs and what songs would go over at certain situations. And so Elvis would look to Charlie and Charlie would, under his breath, you wouldn't hear him, but he would call out a song title. I'd have to say that Charlie Hodge was... Uh uh, outside of Elvis, the most important man in the Elvis Presley show. Well, one by one they came. I mean, the best of the best. We had Jerry Sheff on bass, Larry Mahoverak on piano, John Wilkerson on rhythm guitar, and the great James Burton on lead guitar, and that fantastic Ronnie Tutt on drums. And I took an acoustic guitar and I sang with Elvis. Larry only made the first engagement for us, and then Glenn Harden joined us with his piano after the next opening. Elvis then called in the, the uh, Imperials Quartet and the Sweet Inspirations. And one of the Sweet Inspirations, it was four of them at that time, was Sissy Houston, the mother of Whitney Houston. And we began to plan the show. Uh, you know, we went and we caught Barbara Streisand, who was kicking off the first month at the New International Hotel. And this is the same stage that Elvis would be on, you see. So he began looking at it, you see, it was such a big stage that you looked alone out there. Barbara looked like she was by herself. And he wanted to have so it, people around him, you know, like, so we had the big orchestra. And he got this idea from going to see uh, Barbara and Tom Jones, who, you know, Tom and Elvis had been friends for just years. And he, seeing the stage and what Tom would wear and everything, he decided what he wanted to wear and kind of how the lighting should be, and, and from watching all these shows, see, he could get an idea of what was happening in Las Vegas today, see. Elvis decided that he didn't think he'd feel comfortable in a tuxedo, so 
What he did is, uh, you know, he was in karate, and then karate they have a, a, an outfit there where it's called a gi. So he and Priscilla designed kind of a, a modernized gi. And uh, that way he could have freedom of movement on stage and do some of those great moves he did when he sang the song. We started uh, planning what we were going to do in uh, 1969 before we opened in Las Vegas. And at first Elvis didn't want to use his guitar. He thought he'd just come out without it. And we sat down and we talked about it. And I said, well, gee, you know, everybody's used to seeing you. Like your first album had that picture of you and guitar on it. And maybe we can use it to first two numbers and then lose it. And so he said, yeah, that'll work. So uh, come out and then different things developed from that, like him hitting me in the stomach with the guitar. Nothing of that was ever really planned. And then he used to like uh, just hand me the guitar after he finished the second number. And then he got where he'd kind of lob it over to me, you know? And uh, then he started doing these karate workout things with it, just going in different directions and everything. And I'm waiting back there, where's it going, where's it going? You know, and then one night, instead of turning around and lobbing it to me, he just threw it over his head like that. Well, from then on, I caught the guitar. I never missed it one time. But if you can see the later uh, videos where I'm catching the guitar, the orchestra actually had a period they put there. They waited, and when you saw me catch the guitar, uh, Joe Garcia had the orchestra go, dot, and, you know, dot, you know, as I called it, big chord. So those things just developed. No, nothing was ever planned. Everything worked off of Elvis and became part of the show. And the rehearsals before the opening were marathons. <laughs> and the intensity and excitement was building and everybody felt it. We'd rehearse all night long sometimes. Somebody asked me one time, you know, like what all I did on stage for Elvis, and it was a number of things. Like I, I laid out the shows, you know, subject to Elvis' approval, of course. And uh, if he wanted to change a song uh, during the show, then it was my job to get it lined back up so that the orchestra could keep their music, you know, in, in line. Because the way the music's laid out that way, you know. And then uh, another thing I do is like Elvis, like on the, you know, the way he worked and everything, at the end of the song sometimes, he'd just be totally out of breath. You know, so um, I'd help hold his note for him. So if he's out of breath, I'd be hanging on to it. And then to help me in case I gave out of breath, it was, it was uh, Ed Enert with the Stamps Quartet. He'd be holding the note too. So Elvis was covered, you know? Charlie was always there to hit the high note in case Elvis didn't, didn't quite make it or didn't want to make it. Charlie was always there to hand him a scarf and to hit that high note if Elvis wanted him to. And it seemed like Charlie always knew when to do it. Somebody was asking me, like I said, about one of these one time, they said, well, you gave Elvis his scarves and water, you laid the show out, you told him what was coming up next. Uh, you were more or less Elvis' stage director. I said, well, I never thought about it that way. I was never given that title, but I guess I was. <laughs> Charlie was sort of Elvis's go-between. He was Elvis's stage musical director, even though there was a big band director, but Charlie really was the guy who told Elvis's band, like, uh, Elvis is gonna work this new song in tonight, we're gonna rehearse for it, and he wants you guys to do this, this, and this. Charlie had a great deal to do with Elvis's stage performance, but people don't, are not aware of that. What happened the night July 26 can only be described as a desert explosion. It was awesome, a cosmic event. It was pure Elvis. It was built on dramatics. I mean, we would have these beautiful introductions and these big dramatic endings. Bah, 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 wah, you know. So it was built on dramatics, and Elvis loved that. He loved it. I think that's... Uh, one of the things he used to when he used to, and he was a little boy in Memphis, and he used to go down to Overton Square and listen to the uh, orchestras play the symphony music with those big endings and everything. And then when that developed into where he had these type of big endings and arrangements in his own songs, I think it, it inspired him and gave him more energy, you know, to have these big things with him now that he observed as a child and admired. If you ever talk with anyone who was there for any of those concerts, they'll tell you they laughed, they cried, they stood. 
They experience something you do only once in a lifetime. On that opening night in uh, Vegas in 1969, uh, boy, there were so many big just superstars, you know, that came to see Elvis, you know. And there was a whole uh, booth section there down front, and there was nothing but stars there, you know. Cary Grant was there, and he came backstage uh, after the show that night. And he said, oh, i got to tell you this. Cary Grant's one of those beautiful people that when he sees beauty, whether it's an art form or a painting, a statue, he gets tears in his eyes. He gets emotional, you know. And they said that the whole time he was uh, in the booth back there watching Elvis' performance, that he just wiped his eyes through the whole thing. He thought it was so beautiful. And he came backstage and he said, Elvis, are you going to take this show on the road? He said, yes, sir, we plan to. He said, oh, that's good. The people should see you. He said, it's so beautiful. And Yul Brenner came backstage one night. And it was that magnificent, big, manly voice of his. You know, he said, Elvis, thank you for the enormous amount of pleasure you've given us this evening. This is very elegant, you know. And uh, Sammy Davis Jr., of course, every time we played Vegas, I think, he came and he wouldn't sit in the booth. He wanted to be right next to the stage at one of those tables. So, like he said, I can see the man work, you know. He was there the night, first night we did, did uh, Dust Spake There, Susica, the, what everybody calls 2001 Space Odyssey. Elvis, that was Elvis's idea, by the way. He went for a drive one day, which a lot of people didn't know he could go out anywhere by himself, but he went out in his Stutz uh, Blackhawk and he came back and he came up to me and said, Charlie, he said, do you remember that theme on the 2001 Space Odyssey? I said, yeah. He said, that'd be a great opening. We had uh, 37 pieces uh, uh, on stage in Las Vegas. The only thing is, uh, on the road, we can only carry the brass. We couldn't carry the reeds and the string. The only time we ever used the reeds and the string on location like that was when we recorded at Madison Square Garden. And then it was conducive there to use the strings and the reeds and the brass. But the whole thing was magic. Elvis, Elvis would want me to play games with him. He didn't want to look like he was that he was picking on me. Like uh, he'd come over sometime and he would like take a drink of water and and then throw water on me, and then he'd say just over show, throw some on me. So it looked like that we were playing with each other and it wasn't just him picking on me, which I would do. And sometimes I'd take a kick at him just as he walked off and just barely miss him, you know, something like that. Those things that weren't planned, you know, like, uh, it's like Elvis coming over to the end of the show and we'd been, been on stage like 45 minutes or 55 minutes. He'd say, what's next, Don? And I'd give him, tell him what's next. He'd say, I don't feel like doing that. What's next? I'd tell him, that. I don't feel like doing that. I said, well, look, we're already done 55 minutes. Do funny how time slips away and let's go home. <laughs> he said, okay. <laughs> One night we were uh, playing an engagement somewhere. I, I don't know where it was. But Elvis saw these two young ladies down at the edge of the stage, and they had a birthday cake that they had prepared for him. And Elvis got down, and he was thanking them. And when he looked up, he had that look in his eyes. He's up to something, you know? And uh, I said, uh-oh, here it comes. In front of 18,000 people, here it comes. And he did. As soon as he said thank you and turned around, he just come over his shoulder with that. And I threw my hand up in front of my face and caught the cake on the back of my hand. Went around behind it and grabbed it like that. But to the audience, it looked like it hit me right in the face. I managed to just get a little bit of icing on my shoulders, and that's it. But he he played like it wasn't planned, it was something that happened, you didn't get angry about it, it was just part of the show. It's like him, you know, uh, some lady threw panties on the stage, you know, and he comes back and put them on my head, and big old J.D. Sumner, he'd go over there and put panties on his head, you know. J.D. and I got the results of everything thrown on stage. Man. Well, the first time I met Elvis Presley, he was just a kid, and uh, he would come to the Sings in Memphis when he was 14 years old as a boy and uh, would hang around backstage asking me everything in the world about how you get into 
show business. And I've said many times I wished I could remember what I told him because I left to do that myself. We, uh, we toured every, anywhere from 12 days to 16 days uh, every month. And in between uh, touring, we'd have like two to three weeks off and we'd go down to Palm Springs and stay or sometimes we'd go to Grayson. Sometimes we'd uh, check into a hotel up in LA so uh, Elvis could see Lisa Marie for a while. And then we kept improving the show, upgrading, you know, adding songs. I never will forget one night we were on a West Coast tour and I was riding in a limousine with Elvis and he leaned over and he said, Charlie, I want to do How Great Thou Art tonight. I said, I'm the only one that knows it. He said, well, you go to the piano and play it then. So when I got there, I went straight over to the band and the voice and everything, because they all knew the song and such professionals. All you had to do is explain to them how it was going to go and they'd be able to do it. And I said, Glendy, uh, I'll sit at the piano and play it until you learn Elvis's phrasing on it. And OK, so we started out with a song we hadn't even rehearsed. And I sat at the piano and I played it for the next three engagements until uh, the band learned it and, and Glenn D. learned his phrasing and everything. And then Joe Gershio wrote an orchestration for it. And without ever rehearsing the song, we ended up with a complete orchestration and one of the greatest songs in the show. There was one event that seemed to trigger a, a different mood in Elvis. I mean, he was fond of most of his cousins and there was a few he loved and they were around all the time. I remember one night in Vegas, he got a phone call and one of his cousins, a very beautiful lady, had died. And he turned to me and he said, Charlie, I don't think I can stand to see another member of my family die. I think I'd rather go first myself. that was ever a friend and uh, to Elvis Presley, it was Charlie Hodge. You know, Elvis seemed to be, you know, fascinated with life after death. He was reading a lot of books in those days, like on metaphysics and philosophy, but he never got away from the Bible. He always would read his Bible. And he left to talk about uh, different philosophies, everything, and, and he'd really, you know, he'd get excited talking about some of these things. And he, he used to love, he'd be driving, like I remember one time we were going to Vegas, and we was taking the back way from Palm Springs through the desert, and Elvis began talking, and the more he'd talk, the slower he'd drive. I think he was everything he hated in other drivers, you know, just drive along, before you know it, he was doing 15, 20 miles an hour and talking. You know, it took so long to get to Vegas. I think Lamar said he felt like a trailblazer or something. <laughs> Elvis didn't even realize he, he was slowing down that much. He didn't. I remember one time when uh, we were on tour, and I went up to Elvis and I said, Elvis, after this tour is over, I think I'm going to, you know, take a trip to Hawaii. I was going to go there by myself, just get away from everybody and, and relax. And Elvis said, Charlie can't do that. Said we, I think we may be doing some recordings after this tour is over. And then he, I, I, I didn't know it at the time, but he called Joe Esposito and said, Joe said, uh, get everybody together because as soon as this tour is over, we're all going to Hawaii on a vacation. So he was going to like surprise me, you know, because he, you know, Elvis would think about other people. And what he did is uh, after I found out about it, then we had two sections because the plane only held 28 people, see? And I got everybody together in Memphis, and I got them as far as L.A. And Joe Esposito had flown on Hawaii and set up everything there. So once we got to L.A., that was all I could do, you know, because the next stop is Hawaii, because it's the longest distance between uh, the U.S. mainland and Hawaii is the longest distance that you can fly without being able to land somewhere. And so uh, we got over there, and that was Elvis's last holiday. We was uh, over in Hawaii. And I remember one time, 
Because uh, the girlfriend he had then was uh, going off and doing her own thing, laying on the beach with her sisters and everything. And he said, at least Charlie's having a good time. He's getting to visit with his friends. Elvis and I used to sit and talk, and then he'd talk about how he'd like to go back to Europe, you know, and he'd like to tour England, and especially Germany and France, you know, where we'd gone while we were in the military. And there seemed to be an urgency about it in his voice. You know, he began to mention things like playing touch football, you know, when we're in Bad Nauheim. And his eyes, you know, kind of, kind of had a haunting look in them, you know. He said, you know, Charlie, I'd like to go back over there while I still look, look like what the fans think I look like. One thing I've picked up here is that no matter where you were, Elvis always had a deep sense of love for his fans, no matter where it was. I guess um, the word you'd want to use that you could sum up Elvis's whole life in a four-letter word, and that's love. I think Elvis's probably his happiest times was when he was on stage, when he's performing for the fans, you know? He was most happy then. I remember once when they were filming the last concert thing we did. And the director came up and said, Mr. Presley, is there anything that you would like us to do? And Elvis said, yes, sir. He said, as much as possible, try to keep the cameras out from in front of the fans because they paid their good money to come see the show and I want to give them the best possible show I can. And that was Elvis. It used to be all the guys were around every day, all day long, you know, it was just like a big boys club, you know, being around Graceland or the house in LA. But then as the guys, as we grew older and, and the guys were married and their children were growing up themselves, uh, we didn't have everybody there all the time. Everybody would come there when we had to go on tour. They'd come there for a special occasion. But like at, at, at Graceland, uh, the rest of the guys would be off with their families and everything, and it would be me and Billy Smith there. And Elvis didn't want you to get out of his sight, you know. Uh, I remember one Christmas, I was uh, going home for Christmas, and Elvis looked at me and said, Charlie, you got to where you do this every year. I said, well, Elvis, it's Christmas, and that's my mom and dad. He said, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> he had forgotten I had a mother and dad, and I was visiting them. I, all he'd know, do is I was leaving home, and he wanted me there. <laughs> we were a very close-knit group. Elvis was, he loved all the, the musicians, Scotty Moore, DJ Fontana, and all the musicians that worked with him. He loved all the Jordanaires, Millie Kirkham, Kathy Westmoreland, all the many people that worked with him. It was like one big family, because first of all, Elvis did not have brothers or sisters. So people like Charlie and, and all of us, we were like a very close-knit family, and I shall always treasure that. You know, Elvis is one of the few people I ever met who had the spirit of Christmas year-round. I can't begin to tell you all the things he gave away to people over the years. He gave millions in cars and jewels and horses, boats, dogs. He supported 50 charities in Memphis alone. You never read much in the press about that. I remember one night when uh, I was sitting upstairs with Elvis in his bedroom. And it was one of those nights when there wasn't anybody around and you could feel the loneliness that seemed to be encircling Graceland. And they was talking about how the guys just weren't around much anymore. You know, he said, it's like when we're on the road. Uh, I don't see them until time for the show. And they pick me up and take me to the show and then they deliver me back to the room like a, a side of meat or something. And then they go and do their thing. He said, it's, it's just not like it used to be, is it, Charlie? And I said, no, it's not. And all the time Elvis was, was, was talking, he'd be stretching his, his hands, you know, and like that. And, and he'd take his feet and, 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 you know, turn them back and stretch them. And uh, he said it, was, it seemed like he was sore you know, just all over his whole body. And I know me and Billy Smith, his cousin, a lot of times we'd be up there and he'd say, 
Would you mind rubbing my back some of that lotion? Said, my body just seems to be aching and sore all over. I guess he thought it was from working as hard as you did on stage, you know. He, you know, in retrospect, and looking back, now you can see what the problem was. But it was much later and too late when we found out. Elvis told me one night when we were doing concerts, he said, Charlie, about halfway through the show, I'm just totally exhausted. And I noticed that, you know, that his eyes, you know, they looked tired. You know, he was tired, that's all. At least that's what we all thought. Larry Geller probably was responsible for bringing Elvis more books that he enjoyed reading than anyone else. I know that shortly before Elvis died, he brought a list to me of uh, books he wanted Larry to bring in from Hollywood. And while I was on the phone to Larry, Elvis got on the phone. Larry said, I want those books right now, so you come in early. And Larry said, I will, but he didn't. He came in the 15th of August. And he gave me the books, and I took them upstairs, and Elvis was asleep. I put them where he could get them, put the shroud of Turin, Italy on it, on top. And then when we found Elvis, the book that was he'd been reading there, the last book he read was the shroud of Turin, Italy. But always his favorite book, and the book he read more than any other book. He always had one beside him in every bed he slept in, whether it was a motel room, a hotel room, or his home. He had the Bible. The Bible was Elvis's favorite book. You were with him in the good times and the bad times. And as his closest friend, Charlie, please uh, take time and tell us about the end. There were all kind of rumors after Elvis' uh, death. There was, you know, fantastic stories, and most of them just rumors and nothing more. There's no truth to They discovered during the autopsy that the right side of Elvis's heart was twice as big as the left side, and that he had ha already had three heart attacks already and didn't even know it. And of course, he had a bad liver just like his mother did, and they were trying to fix that. And he had always had a trouble with high blood pressure, and his mother had that. Same thing. And also he had glaucoma, and he had to take uh, medicine for that. And one night, one day, it was, I was over visiting Mr. Presley at his house, and Elvis' his friend, Dr. Nicopolis, came over and told us something that kind of cleared up a lot of things we'd thought about of why Elvis was always so sore and everything. And Dr. Nick told this to Mr. Preston and then he looked at me and said, Charlie, this is in strictest confidence. And we didn't mention it to anybody. I didn't mention it myself to anyone until after Mr. Presley had died and then I put it in my book. And what they discovered was that Elvis had bone cancer and it had spread over his entire body. So that kind of explains the stretching and wanting the body rub. He was hurting and there was pain from that and he didn't even know what it was and we didn't either. I don't know the answers about life and death. I do know Elvis had faith in God and had never wavered. All I can tell you is that a bright, vibrant light, an exceptional soul, walked over to me on a Memphis stage one night. I traveled around the world with him. I was privileged to share some of his most private moments. And I witnessed his unequal generosity. Watched him give him himself to everyone. And I saw the impact he made on the whole world. We're all just a little bit better for his having been here. Lead me, guide me along the way. For if you leave me, I cannot stray. Time.
I can't thank Charlie Hodge enough for the help and the guidance he's given me. We met years ago and he has been supportive of every effort that I've ever done. He's tried to show me more tidbits about Elvis, mannerisms, and yet he's also been kind enough to allow me to be myself and find a way to do it. The reason this show is happening at the power and the effectiveness it is is because of Charlie Hodge's input. Thanks, Charlie. Won't you leave me? Charlie Hodge, ladies and gentlemen.